Hey, this is Sheldon Primus with OSHA Compliance Help. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to do a brief presentation on what it takes to be compliant with OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, uh, for the pest management sector. This is a presentation that I put together before for a large pest management association in Florida. However, I'm going to adapt it, shorten it, so it's only going to be a brief uh, five to six minute presentation for you, but I'll give you the basics so that you'll know exactly where to go and then how to help yourself be compliant with the regulatory agency. I will tell you uh, that it is not a sound studio. It is a home office. Therefore, you may have some background noise, but that's okay. The information is still relevant for you, and uh, we'll make sure that I can edit out as much of the background noise as I can. So let's move on. A little bit about myself. So I'm the owner of a OSHA Compliance Help, like I mentioned, and my other company is called Utility Compliance Inc. And I do service the utility sector, mostly the water and wastewater sector. I am a certified occupational safety specialist, and that is COSS, C-O-S-S. -S. I'm a trainer for the COSS program. I'm also an authorized trainer for general industry and construction for the 10 and 30 hour OSHA outreach programs and I am a safety consultant as well. This was the agenda that we used for that uh, training and we went through all this. It was uh, a nice module uh, type training, went to a few different locations and brought this training. So I'm gonna do some highlights for you of this program, but you're not gonna get everything. The intro to OSHA portion is two hours, uh, but so we're not even gonna get into that, but we will go over several things. And my output here is to make sure that you have all the compliance tips that you need to be able to have a program that is effective for your workers and then also uh, keep you in compliance with OSHA uh, guidelines and regulations. Uh, the intro to OSHA portion, I was just explaining so much about OSHA's jurisdictions, uh, explaining about what a fatality and a catastrophe is. In the eyes of OSHA, if there's one fatality, uh, then you have to contact them within eight hours. But if there is one hospitalization, one amputation, one loss of eye, that's, that is a catastrophe. Therefore, OSHA, OSHA says you have to let them know within 24 hours that there was a catastrophe and you could call their hotline on the OSHA.gov website. Uh, if you are near a computer, and uh, obviously you are if you're watching this, uh, you should get a hold of the OSHA Quick Takes. And that is their bi-weekly newsletter. And that will give you all the uh, updates of what's happening with the federal OSHA and it's a wonderful publication for you. I have found different requirements with the standard industrial classification code that's SIC code for the pest control. Uh, if you were to look it up and I do have hyperlinks for each one of these but I will show you the one that I believe most codes will be you know, the watching this video and that's 7342 so let's go over to 7342 and see where that takes us so if your company and I'll zoom in a little bit more if your uh, output for your company is any of these things here with uh, disinfecting pest control uh, and you see the list here then that is your sick code so 7342 it's important to know that code. So let's go back to the presentation and I will show you another code, another system that is uh, good to know. And that is your North American Industry Classification System Code, NAICS. And that code is a more detailed code for your uh, pest uh, management professionals. Uh, I have a hyperlink for these and in my mind I'm imagining that most of you will probably be 56710. So let's take a closer look at what 56710 says. And that one says basically about the same thing that you would see here in this uh, coding. 
but it's uh, a little bit more detailed uh, system. So I will close this one out and let's go to the next section here. This is what makes it important to know your SIG code. Once you get your SIG code and your NAICS code, then you can look it up on the OSHA's website and you can find the frequently cited standards for your code. And I looked that up, I did a screenshot for you. So the frequently cited standard for your code 561710, it says that most of the citations here, uh, you have a maintenance, safeguarding, uh, for the exit routes, basically uh, exit routes were blocked. And that's in your 1910. 1910 is the general industry uh, standard book. And uh, it looks like OSHA did one inspection here. And then they had two citations from that one inspection for uh, $1,300. And if you go down a little further, you've got one inspection, one citation, for medical services isn't that providing medical services gave a citation and uh, that citation was seven thousand dollars therefore it's very important that you provide medical uh, services and first aid and then on the very bottom you see this OSHA Act general duty paragraph and that is a 5A1 and that means that you as the employer have a right or not more than how right you have a responsibility to make sure that all your workers are protected from a harmful environment uh, from any known or suspected hazard that you have to make sure you protect your workers from that so that is your 5a1 and I'm gonna uh, go over a few more of these I need to do a quick pause but I will return in a second but I'll I'll be right back now with the required program I look through that sick code that we saw for uh, your five uh, well both the sick code here 7342 and your NAICS code as 561710 and these are the programs that are typically associated with the pest management uh, sector fall protection, general safety and health, hazard communication, a lockout tagout program, a powered industrial truck, respiratory protection, and other PPE, uh, emergency action plan, which is physically for your uh, location. If you have more than 10 employees, then you have to have a written emergency action plan for your, uh, your physical uh, shop as well as your fire prevention plan. Again, 10 or more employees is the trigger for that. So if you look through these citations here, and each one of those citations can kind of give you an idea of what kind of programs you should have. And uh, your powered industrial truck, you got two different citations for that powered industrial truck. That's your forklifts. If you're using forklifts on your facility, then you should have uh, everyone in compliance with that standard. And that is your uh, 1910 standard. So let's scoot down. The job hazard analysis. I did go over what a job hazard analysis is. I always add that in my training because in my mind, if you do an effective job hazard analysis for every task that you do, then you could actually have a better safety and health program. So very simply, the job hazard analysis is this. You pick a job, a task, something that you do. Then you pick, you lay it out like a standard operating procedure, step by step by step, how to accomplish that job. Then the very next thing you do is for each step, you pick a hazard associated with that step, and then you pick a control for that hazard for that step. Your control of hazards are three which is engineering control, something like a machine guard or a barricade, uh, your uh, physical th uh, thing, that's, that's your engineering control. Second is your admin control, administration control, your work role. And then third, the last control is your PPE, the things that you actually have to wear in order to protect yourself when you're in an environment that has a hazard. Then that's the last line of defense. 
So the lockout tagout program, uh, in your lockout tagout and then also confined space, there is an interpretation letter which I have and I'll show you to you that crawl spaces and attics do count as a confined space entry. Therefore, the question is, is it permit required confined space or is it a not permit required confined space? So going up into an attic in a residential home, OSHA does not have jurisdiction over residential homes. However, if you're going into an attic or a crawl space for an actual uh, physical industrial setting or commercial setting, OSHA does have jurisdiction over that. And it would be a permit required confined space if the conditions of a confined space are met and you have a hazard. So here are the conditions for a confined space. One is someone can physically get into that confined space. Then two, there's not too many ways to get in and out of that confined space. And then three, uh, it was not meant for continuous human occupancy. If you have all three of those conditions, it is a confined space. Now the permit portion of it is if there is an actual hazard uh, that is there in that confined space. So that therefore, if you could remove the hazard, then you could remove the requirement for having to write a permit. So in this letter of interpretation, they ask very specifically, are attics considered confined spaces? And then OSHA says, basically, if it hits the criteria for a confined space it is however attic spaces uh, that are determined to be confined spaces should generally fall into the category of non-permit confined spaces because of either natural or mechanical ventilation so therefore it's taking away the hazard of that uh, has atmospheric hazard uh, so that is it and same thing here with a uh, crawl space under this question here and they ask basically if the crawl space are uh, uh, confined spaces and OSHA says it's the same thing uh, and you're not required to do a, a permit if you eliminate whatever that hazard is in that environment. So that one you should look up uh, for confined space entry and lockout tagout in OSHA's book which is 29 CFR 1910 that's OSHA's uh, uh, guidance is 1910 regulation so let's look at that 1910 and up top I'll show you the standard is 146 1910 146 is where you'll find the confined space entry hazardous communication that's changed uh, the HASCOM is 1910 1200 is hazardous communication and that's a, a big read it's a big portion that I can't go over in the time we have here however look up 1910 1200 and you'll be able to see that there is new changes this is the globally harmonized system for classification and labeling of chemicals which is in short called GHS and that new GHS system is going to be uh, fully in operation uh, the end of December 2015 Therefore, all uh, businesses are going to have to convert over to that in uh, uh, basically January 2016 is when uh, you're going to have to switch everything over there. However, in pest control, you do have another entity that regulates you other than OSHA, Department of Agriculture. So if you have pesticides, rodenticides, fungicides, those are not under the OSHA requirements or under the Department of Agriculture. So make sure you check Department of Agriculture's labeling requirements so you could be in compliance with that. Uh, material handling and PPE, uh, that's a, a video that I showed from YouTube, but uh, hazardous material and handle, handling hazardous material, it's a lot about awareness and making sure that you are definitely uh, trained to know what you're around and that's part of the right to know laws too. I'm going to click on what's a hazard assessment form. This is a hazard assessment form that is from the Duke University Safety Institute and it is a requirement in subpart I in 1910 that you have to have 
a hazard assessment uh, form. So if you do not have a hazard assessment certificate, therefore you're in violation. So this is a PPE hazard assessment certificate. Uh, it's for, free from uh, Duke University and this is a fillable PDF form and it's pointing out what the hazard is either by job type or location and then what the person needs to wear to protect themselves from that hazard so that's where you have all these items and it must be signed and dated as to who did it and to make it a, an official document uh, one of the big things with PPE for uh, chemical handling is medical excuse me is uh, having respiratory protection anything that goes it's inhaled into the body can pose uh, significant damage to the body and the respiratory system as well as uh, some other areas lungs and your uh, your uh, just brain functions any of those things could cause a hazard so the requirement is if you have a double strap filtering face piece that is not a filtering face piece. It is a disposable respirator. That is an N95 respirator. So if you're using a half face cartridge, a full face cartridge, those are obviously respirators. In order to wear that, you have to make sure the worker has not only a medical evaluation, but then an annual fit testing. So there is a annual, uh, let's see, it's 1910, 134 Appendix C, gives a little example of what this questionnaire would look like. So I'll show you here what that looks like very briefly. I know we're running out of time, but uh, right here is what that questionnaire looks like. There's some flag questions that they ask if you've had a seizure, diabetes, allergic reaction that interferes with your breathing. All these things are uh, set up these questions to see if the person wearing the respirator can be fit to wear a respirator. And then after the medical questionnaire is completed, it's handed to a medical provider who looks it over. And if the medical provider says, nope, something here is a flag, and this person cannot wear a respirator, if they are wearing a respirator after that, then the employer can be held liable. So make sure you watch out for that. Part of the training and the fit testing is showing how to wear the respirator itself, how to put it on, how to take it off, how to clean it, all the different uh, uh, functions of the mask. If it's a full, if it's a half, if it's just a disposable respirator, uh, then yeah, that training has to be in there. If you do have a voluntary program, you have to make sure that the person who's voluntarily wearing a mask uh, knows exactly what the hazards are or the limitation of that is. And uh, you have to give them a copy of that Appendix D that you would find in uh, the subpart I. And give them a copy, make sure they sign off that they received it. Uh, these are other procedures. I'll just keep that up for you to see, but I'm not going to go over all these different procedures that involve in a fit test and uh, these exercise regimens that you have to do is just all to prove that the person is fit to wear the respirator before they go out in the field and they actually wear that respirator, including this rainbow passage that they would have to say that would test it. Uh, emergency action plan, fire prevention plan I did mention to you. Fall protection is a big one. So I'll end with fall protection because that's a, a, a big issue, especially in general industry. It's about to, in my opinion, be switched over general industry to mirror the standard of construction and maritime where it's going to be more stringent. In fall protection, uh, in for pest control, you have fumigation, you have uh, docks, you have several things that you're going to be elevated, therefore the worker must be protected. So if the worker is elevated above four feet right now in general industry, that's the general, uh, the, it, it's, it's basically what, what OSHA is looking for, protection for four fish, uh, feet, construction says six. Uh, so if you are in fumigation, and you try to say it's infeasible for us to 
half fall protection because we're going to be tenting where we would anchor off and that anchor point should be 5,000 pounds of protection per each employee. OSHA says there's so many things out there right now that you could use that will be an alternative to anchoring off to the roof. Therefore, it's in not infeasible for you to protect the workers in a fumigation job in the eyes of OSHA. So there's a horizontal lifeline. You got a shock, a shock absorber, a lanyard, full body harness. Uh, that one is for a slope roof. But again, you see the anchor point is on the roof itself. Uh, there's an anchor point with a safety belt that's going to restrict the worker from getting to the ends. So therefore, that's uh, those are things that will probably not work. But you have, in this picture, you'll see a few different portable type of tie-offs, basically anchor points. So that's a portable system. Uh, ladder use is also uh, applicable for this. You have fall protection that you have to look out for. Uh, with ladder use, make sure that you observe the maximum load. Uh, make sure the workers are not using uh, or lifting something as they're going up the ladders. Maintain three points of contact. And then also uh, for heavy things, it might be, well, it would work better to have uh, a system where mechanically you can lift those things and the worker then could, uh, like a tarp, the worker after it's mechanically, the tarps mechanically lifted to the top of the roof, then they could work their way down. So those are some of the things to go over. Uh, I will not go over everything. I'm going to leave my contact information for you here. So if you guys needed to, uh, to contact me, you can. You got OSHA Compliance Help and Sheldon at OSHAcompliancehelp.com. I'm on Twitter as at OSHA, uh, OSHA Comp Help. Facebook.com slash OSHA Compliance Help. So those are the different ways you can reach me. Uh, my number is 888-398-0120, extension 102. So have a great day and thank you for your time. And again, leave a comment under here. So if you could leave a comment, let me know how I did. If you have some more information that you want to need or you need, then let me know that as well. And I'll see if I can provide it for you. So thank you and have a wonderful day. And uh, I'm really glad my dog didn't bark while we're doing this. So excellent. Uh, bye for now.